Uh, I am Dr. Siddharth. Uh, today we will take a brief uh, account about uh, metabolic bone diseases, uh, most, uh, mo the most important one being rickets, which uh, is important from the exam point of view and important in the point of view that early diagnosis and treatment uh, makes it a quite uh, easily treatable and uh, early intervention is possible in this disease. The other disorders we will cover uh, include hyperparathyroidism and osteo osteomalacia and osteoporosis. Uh, so, what are uh, the basic, uh, so here we start with metabolic bone diseases. The basic aim of uh, today's uh, lecture would be to get a brief account of calcium regulation, rickets and osteomalacia, osteoporosis and hyperparathyroidism. Rickets and hyperparathyroidism are uh, important questions from exam point of view. So, uh, I'll give you uh, in detail on how to write the answers and the, what are the headings for the answers. So uh, we come to bone. Uh, bone is an osseous tissue which is made up of inorganic, organic uh, material along with water. The distribution being in organic there is 25%, uh, inorganic is 65% and water is 10%. The organic constituent has bone cells and intracellular matrix. The bone cells being osteoclasts, osteoblasts and osteocytes. Whereas the inorganic has crystalline which is the hydroxy appetite or uh, the cement like structure which forms the main bone structure, the amorphous and the ions. Thus the ions are the calcium and the phosphorus ions and 10% of the total body water is made up in the bone. Uh, so calcium, 99% uh, of the calcium which is present out of the 65% um, inorganic, the 99% of calcium is present in the bones and the teeth in the body. Um, calcium ions are the most abundant ion, uh, cations in the body but out of the 99% the exchangeable pool of calcium ions is only 1 to 2 percent. So what is uh, bone and calcium and what is the regulation? So basically we can say uh, there is a rule of three for calcium regulation which can be explained uh, as three tissues, three hormones and three cells. The three important tissues are the bone, the intestine and the kidney which are important in the regulation of calcium. The three hormones are parathyroid hormone, calcitonin and uh, vitamin D3 and the three cells are the osteoblasts, osteocytes and osteoclasts. So the osteoblasts are the ones which lay bone and the osteoclasts are the one which remove calcium from the bone. So what is the basic function of uh, calcium in the body? You have uh, uh, basic six functions are there. Uh, one being bone uh, remodeling and uh, growth, second is tooth formation, third calcium acts as an important uh, an a cation in the uh, neuromuscular junction transmission that is the synaptic transmission, uh, the, it acts as an important coenzyme uh, functioning molecule, uh, it acts as a neuromuscular and a nerve muscle transmitter and finally it acts as a second and third in messenger in the intracellular signal transduction pathways. From the physiological process, the importance are the bone formation, the uh, blood clotting which requires calcium ions for binding of the platelets, uh, brain function as a neurotransmitter, in the heart it acts uh, for myocardial contraction, uh, same with the muscle uh, for muscle contraction. Uh, what are the sources of calcium that we say? Uh, the best sources would be milk and milk products, egg, fish and bone. The cheapest would be uh, green leafy vegetables, cereals and millets, though the calcium is not very well absorbed from these sources. Other sources being beans, soya bean and potato. Drinking water also provides calcium which is around 200 mg of calcium per day. So what is the required daily amount of calcium that we require is 400 to 500 mg of calcium is suggested for an adult. In case of pregnancy, uh, lactating mothers and growing children. Uh, slightly higher amount uh, of physiological calcium is required so therefore the uh, required daily allowance goes up for uh, lactating mothers and children. Uh, the metabolism of calcium as uh, it looks uh, complicated but it's quite easy. Uh, basically uh, we consider that uh, we are ingesting calcium which comes into the intestine first. From the intestine certain amount of calcium is absorbed into the uh, plasma and certain amount is excreted. Also, certain amount of plasma calcium is lost into the intestine via digestive juices. This, uh, if we uh, consider 1000 mg, uh, 500 mg of calcium will be absorbed. 
whereas 150 mg will be lost by digestive juices so a total of 650 mg is excreted in the feces out of which only 150 is considered as endogenous losses. Similarly, calcium is excreted into the kidneys but 99% of the calcium is reabsorbed. So around 200 uh, mg of uh, calcium is lost through the urine and finally bone. Calcium is in a continuous homeostasis with the bone. Uh, there is a net loss being uh, almost zero even considered with bone. Finally, there is a certain loss, endogenous loss of calcium is through the sweat uh, which is around 30 to 150 mg. So considering uh, 150 mg in feces, 200 in urine and 150 mg in the sweat, we come to uh, around 450 mg of calcium which is lost as endogenous losses through the body. So uh, this is how, uh, this is what helps us define the required daily allowance of calcium uh, that is required. Further, uh, as we can see in the chart, uh, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin play an important role in the regulation of calcium. We shall come to that later. So uh, uh, there are three hormones, as I said earlier, the three hormones that are important are the uh, vitamin D, the parathyroid hormone and the calcitonin hormone. What are the functions of each hormone? in on the three major structures that we mentioned before that is the intestine, the kidney and the bone. So uh, we start with parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone will increase the blood calcium and phosphorus uh, levels uh, irrespective of uh, the, uh, will try to increase blood calcium levels and maintain blood calcium levels irrespective of the, uh, what a state of phosphorus is. So basically parathyroid hormone under the influence uh, influences vitamin D hormone which increases calcium and phosphorus reabsorption from the intestine. Secondly, in case of a negative calcium balance, that is calcium is less in the body in case of uh, diseases like rickets and osteomalacia, uh, what calcium does is it decreases, uh, what parathyroid hormone does on the kidney is it, that it decreases the calcium uh, excretion uh, in, with uh, increased excretion of the phosphorus ions. So as you can see in the kidney there is decreased calcium excretion and increased phosphorus excretion. Whereas parathyroid hormone as I said come what may it is going to maintain the calcium in the blood. So if there is a deficiency of calcium uh, it is going to increase bone resorption of calcium and uh, forms uh, decreases uh, the speed of bone formation. So the net effect of parathyroid hormone on the whole body as a whole is it increases plasma calcium at, uh, at the, at the, uh, uh, with the decrease in the plasma phosphorus. Now vitamin D. Vitamin D uh, increases the calcium absorption and phosphorus absorption from the intestine. Uh, it decreases, uh, again vitamin D helps in the reabsorption of uh, calcium from the kidney. So it decreases calcium and phosphorus excretion from the kidney which is different from parathyroid hormone which will decrease, uh, which will increase calcium reabsorption at the, uh, at the uh, with respect to the phosphorus. Uh, now vitamin D will also act on the bone that is it is increasing the bone resorption and increases bone formation but the action of vitamin D is such that the bone formation is more than bone resorption hence there is no net bone loss. And therefore what is the net effect of vitamin D on the body is it increases plasma calcium and increases plasma phosphorus levels. Calcitonin is another hormone which is also important. This hormone is important with the point of view that it increases it uh, increases the bone formation and uh, thus helps making the bone stronger. But uh, calcitonin does not have any effect on the intestines. What it uh, affects is the kidneys. Kidneys it will increase calcium and phosphorus excretion by main, uh, the his uh, calcitonin is opposite to vitamin D and uh, parathyroid hormone. Uh, so that if there is increased plasma calcium it is going to decrease it. So this can be done by two methods. One is calcium and phosphorus excretion from the kidneys and secondly is uh, improved bone formation thus helping deposition of calcium into the bone therefore also decreases bone resorption. So net effect being that it decreases plasma calcium and decreases plasma phosphorus. So calcitonin is the one which is going to improve your bone formation whereas vitamin D and parathyroid are important in maintaining the plasma calcium levels which are required for normal bodily function. So uh, as we can, as we saw the overview, basically we saw that uh, what is uh, the bone, what are the constituents of a bone, what is the calcium, uh, what are the regulation of calcium, what are the functions of a calcium, what is the rule of three, that is the three hormones, the three uh, body uh, sites uh, and the three uh, cells that are responsible for regulation of calcium in the body and we saw regulation of calcium by parathyroid hormone and vitamin D.
so now uh, have now that we have a small idea of what uh, vitamin d and parathyroid hormone uh, does to the body uh, we come to uh, the pathological uh, problems of what uh, uh, problem in metabolic uh, regulation of calcium can happen that is rickets and osteomalacia is the first rickets is important by the point of view of exam that you get uh, questions on rickets and uh, from clinical point of view that if caught early in small children uh, appropriate treatment uh, helps reduce the deformities and helps uh, a good progress of the child so what is rickets and osteomalacia uh, these are basically disorders of the organic matrix of the bone which there are two important things the organic matrix fails to calcify properly thus leaving large osteoid matrices uh, we'll come to this during pathogenesis i'll explain to you uh, what are matrices and uh, what is the failure of calcification so uh, manifestation of both the diseases uh, the only difference is that they occur at different stages of life uh, rickets which occurs in uh, children with growing bones whereas uh, osteomalacia it occurs in adults so uh, we come to rickets uh, there are um, rickets is uh, etiologically classified you can say that there are two types of rickets the first one being uh, due to deficiency of vitamin d or a disturbance in the metabolism of vitamin d therefore uh, what we come to deficiency of vitamin d uh, is that there is diminished intake or there is diminished absorption of the vitamin d intake will be due to malnutrition and absorption due to will be due to some syndromes such as malabsorption syndrome like crohn's disease or ulcerative pruritus gastric abnormalities or post operative post gastric tummy where uh, calcium is mostly absorbed in the uh, in the stomach and the proximal uh, duodenum so if uh, surgical resection is carried out it is going to decrease the absorption uh, biliary diseases again biliary uh, bile salts are required for absorption so uh, this will cause a decrease in the absorption uh, lack of exposure to sunlight decreases the formation of vitamin d in the body active vitamin d when active vitamin d is decreased there is going to be a decrease in the calcium absorption from the intestine and reabsorption from the kidneys so this is how vitamin d will form uh, deficiency of vitamin d will act whereas uh, what is disturbance in vitamin d metabolism is hepatic factor the liver contains an enzyme uh, known as 25 hydrox alpha hydroxylase which is required for the first step of vitamin d formation from cholecalciferol so lack of this factor uh, will cause uh, decrease in vitamin d whereas increased uh, degradation of vitamin d in case of anti convulsant therapies due to liver dysfunction will again decrease uh, vitamin d in the body in cases of renal disorders uh, there is the hormone known as 1 alpha hydroxylase which is, is present in the uh, kidney again or uh, disorders of the kidneys uh, such as chronic renal failures is going to cause a problem with the i1 alpha hydroxylation process which is the final step in the formation of uh, 125 di hydrocholecalciferol and uh, thus the active form of vitamin d and hence you will have decreased active form of vitamin d uh, these are two one is hepatic renal the third one being unresponsiveness of the uh, target cells to 125 d hydrocholecalciferol or uh, the active form of vitamin d that is and final renal osteodystrophy is the final cause which uh, which is in type 1 type 1 again being deficiency of vitamin d and disturbance in the vitamin d metabolism in type 2 we have a problem with the phosphorus ions so defective absorption of the phosphorus through renal tubules will lead to certain uh, genetic disorders most commonly they are the uh, X linked hypophosphatemic rickets, which is an X linked dominant disorder, the Fanconi syndrome, uh, renal tubular acidosis, and oncogenic rickets. Uh, diminished intake of, of phosphates will also affect the metabolism in a similar way. So, what is the pathogenesis? So, bone formation basically takes place by enchondral ossification. What is enchondral ossification is when bone formation occurs, the cartilage first forms, the cartilage then undergoes calcification and this process of calcification is the main pathogenic process which is affected in the rickets so uh, we have an epiphyseal plate that is the growth plate where cal cartilage proliferation occurs this proliferation is followed by calcification of the cartilage which leads to bone formation in rickets you have a defor uh, you have a deficiency of calcium or a deficiency of vitamin d which leads to improper calcification of the so formed cartilage what happens is once the calcification is hampered there is accumulation of large amounts of cartilaginous tissue at the same site so this gives you an important uh, picture on the x-ray which is known as a uh, epiphyseal widening uh, because the epiphysis goes on widening 
but the calcium is not deposited it will appear radiolucent on the x-ray this is the basic pathogenic process which occurs in case of rickets so uh, what are the uh, clinical features that you come uh, we divided the clinical features into symptoms and signs symptoms uh, basically uh, there is a history of dietary deficiency or malnutrition usually will be associated may be associated with poverty or any other cause uh, there is severe sweating or severe diaphoresis which will lead to calcium losses uh, there is a child because of calcium losses there is pro uh, a disruption in the proper regular neurotransmission so the child will appear restless the child will have a loss of apathy or a dis uh, the child will have an apathy or that is a disinclination from playing there will be delayed milestones the child will start walking late the child will start weight bearing late there will be irritability in the child they are easily irritable easily crying children and finally uh, due to the calcium which maintains the um, uh, resting membrane potentials there will be abnormal firing in the brain which will uh, lead to convulsions or uh, uh, convulsion like symptoms so uh, now we come to the signs uh, a child comes to you in the opd uh, we uh, these are certain signs which uh, when familiar with will give you a spot diagnosis of uh, rickets one is uh, craniotibies craniotibies is basically a soft sponge like when you uh, when a pressure is applied on the bone uh, due to excess cartilage the bone is going to spring back like a sponge this is known as craniotibies there is a uh, frontal bossing there is a delayed closure of the fontanel which will give you a hot cross bun like appearance on the uh, skull uh, the uh, costochondral junctions there will be a uh, swelling over the costochondral junctions which is known as rachitic rosary this is different from scorbutic rosary which is seen in vitamin c deficiency in that this uh, rachitic rosary is beaded whereas scorbutic rosary is sharp and pointed Hari harrison circle as you can see in the image is a uh, uh, sulcus like structure which is present below the lower border of the rib uh, pigeon chest is due to narrowing of the uh, increase in ap diameter and narrowing of the transverse diameter of the chest epiphyseal widening will be noted at the distal ends of the femur the distal end of the radius and the distal tibial epiphysis uh, knock knees also known as bowing of knees is a very common and very prominent feature seen in children with rickets so uh, we come to two clinical features uh, the clinical features as you can see on the right hand side uh, this is a child with uh, classical harrison sulcus which you can see over the lower border of the uh, rib cage uh, the pigeon like chest which is uh, in decrease in the transverse diameter and increase in the ap diameter of the chest and you can see small beaded structures uh, on two sides of the manubrium this is known as rachitic rosary whereas on the other side you see uh, the, on the child with the image b uh, the child has a knock knee um, kind of picture whereas the other one has deformities known as wind swept deformity as you can see uh, the disease is usually uh, quite in a see, quite commonly seen in malnourished children and this is uh, again due to deficiency of vitamin d and calcium so again uh, now as i explained to you that uh, there is a increased uh, epiphyseal widening due to uh, hypertrophy of the cartilage due to decreased calcification the following uh, radiological features will be seen there will be delayed appearance of the epiphysis epiphysis appearance on x-ray is due to calcification as there is decreased calcium it's going to delay the appearance of the epiphysis on the x-ray there will be widened epiphyseal plates the same epiphysis which uh, widens due to decreased calcification is going to press into the metaphyseal region causing metaphyseal club, uh, cupping and sp spreading that is playing of the metaphysis and finally the calcification of the diaphysis or the shaft is going to be decreased so it will appear more translucent when compared to the bones of a normal child and the bony deformities that we see as i told you before there will be scorbutic rosary knock knee uh, wind swept deformity uh, these are commonly seen so we come to a radiological feature uh, as you can see uh, in both the x-rays even the distal end of the femur or the proximal end of the tibia uh, the radial ends you can see that there is a quite a widening of the epiphyseal plate splaying and a, a comb shaped margin of the uh, radial uh, epiphysis or the metaphysis this is known as splaying and cupping and uh, you can see there is tibial bowing which is commonly seen in case of rickets so uh, radiological investigations are mostly diagnostic in uh, case of rickets but other investigations that we go for a serum calcium serum phosphate and uh, serum alkaline phosphatase 
so serum calcium uh, will be low to uh, will be normal or low as the body tries to compensate for the uh, decrease in uh, calcium to maintain body function so uh, most of the times a child with rickets is going to have normal serum calcium the thing to measure in case of rickets is serum phosphorus serum phosphorus is the one which is going to get thrown out in uh, for uh, reabsorption of calcium so usually serum phosphorus is low as uh, there is uh, increased bone formation uh, any disease or uh, any lesion which is going to increase bone formation is going to increase the serum alkaline phosphatase. This is true with in case of osteoblastic tumors and is also case in uh, case of it's uh, seen post traumatic when the bone is trying to heal. Whenever there is a process which leads to good and fast bone formation, there is going to be an increase in the serum alkaline phosphatase. So what? How do you treat? How do you treat it? Is basically you have two types of management. One is the medical line of management and the orthopedic line of management. So basically for every patient medical line of management is important. What is medical line of management is you give a stat dose of 6 lakh international units of vitamin D in the child. Now this is going to help, this single dose is going to produce rapid healing in the child because the child is growing at a good rate. Following 6 lakh international units you are going to give a maintenance dose of 400 international units per day till how do you monitor uh, whether the child, the treatment is functioning on the child or no. The response is basically seen as a white sclerotic line on the epiphysis or the metaphyseal growth plate. Here the calcium is going to slowly start getting deposited which will produce a radio opaque white line of sclerosis on the x-ray. So this will help you guide whether uh, treatment is uh, your treatment is working or is not working. In case the treatment is not working then you suspect that the cause of vitamin uh, the cause of uh, rickets is something uh, like um, the autosomal X-linked dominant disorders like hypophosphatemic rickets or generally other causes other than basic vitamin D deficiency. What is the role or an, of an orthopedics in rickets? All children with deformities are going to present with orthopedics. So it is uh, essential that an uh, orthopedic surgeon knows about these disorders and is uh, basically know how to treat them medically as well as ortho, uh, as well as uh, orthopedic line of management. So we have two basic line of management that is uh, conservative and operative. Uh, what is the conservative line of management? You treat the child with splints. Splints will uh, basically help in preventing deformities and preventing the fractures and when applied during the healing phase will help correct deformity as much as possible. Deformities when a child is diagnosed late and uh, when deformities uh, are not completely corrected or residual deformities are present, they are corrected surgically after a minimum of 6 months of medical treatment uh, of the child is complete. So uh, this is a general overview of uh, uh, rickets and as we can see uh, for your exam, from your exam point of view, uh, we go for the following uh, headings as I told you, you go for a causes. You write uh, in brief about the pathogenesis or the etiopathology, the clinical features in symptoms, signs, you go for radiological features, you go for in other investigations and finally you come to the management. So, uh, now we come to osteomalacia is the counterpart of vitamin D deficiency in adults. So what is uh, what are the most important causes of uh, lack? So women practicing the Parda system uh, uh, get, have vitamin D deficiency due to the lack of sunlight exposure. Uh, osteomalacia can also be caused due to other deficiencies such as calcium and phosphorus. There can be malnutrition during pregnancy uh, because an increased amount of calcium is required for the uh, growth of the child uh, leading to a uh, decrease in the uh, calcium levels in the body. Malabsorption syndromes as I mentioned ulcerative colitis or Crohn's is going to affect the absorption of calcium and thus causing deficiency. Post surgical in case of uh, gastric uh, excision or uh, is going to cause a uh, decrease in the absorption of the calcium uh, surfaces from your calcium is going to be absorbed and chronic and finally chronic disorders such as chronic renal failure where uh, there is going to be affection of uh, one alpha hydroxylase which uh, will again lead to deficiency of vitamin D causing a decrease in the uh, causing an imbalance in the calcium metabolism. So uh, what are the basic clinical features of osteomalacia? Osteomalacia is going to present to you with vague symptoms of bone pain. There are going to be uh, patients coming to you 
chronic patients which will have chronic bone pain like symptoms uh, muscular weakness uh, there is going to be bony deformities uh, bony deformities and spontaneous fractures uh, finally uh, what uh, what do you see uh, these patients will come and uh, complain that they are going to, uh, they are having uh, extreme tiredness on minimum function uh, as in they you, they will give you complaints that they will be they were working for long durations and now they have in early tiredness uh, like symptoms so this should uh, point to you that uh, the patient may have a disease of osteomalacia and uh, thus uh, you should go into the uh, in those uh, you should go for a radiological study uh, so basic structures basic problems that you will see on a radiological study is uh, the diffuse rarefaction of bones that there is a uh, complete uh, loss of calcium from the bone the, uh, the diaphysis of the bones looser zones or pseudo fractures these are small uh, radiolucent lines which will be seen on the uh, commonly seen on the neck of the femur and the uh, diaphysial region of the femur if not picked up and diagnosed early they may lead to pathological fractures which will present to you with sudden onset of pain and a history of a uh, long history of bone pain uh, tri radiate pelvis is a common problem which occurs but it is commonly seen in females because as you know that the, the females uh, this will cause a problem in the females during childbirth causing uh, cephalopelvic disproportion and finally protrusive acetabulum due to the erosion of the acetabulum the uh, head of the femur is going to protrude into the pelvis so as you can see uh, in this x-ray this is an x-ray classic x-ray of osteomalacia seen in an adult where you can see loser zones there is a, a, a loss of trabecula in that region and uh, it's not complete it is uh, loser zones are also known as incomplete fractures so you can uh, see that there is an incomplete extension from one cortex to the other uh, I, uh, the other thing that you can notice is there is a diffuse loss of calcium from the body the bones look more radiolucent when compared to that of a normal x-ray uh, the trabeculae which are supposed to be fine have been lost and coarse trabeculae are present and the cortices the cortices which are supposed to be thick have been have thinned out quite a lot so uh, other again uh, what we do is we do other laboratory investigations that um, help us diagnose uh, confirm our diagnosis so bone biopsy loss of bony architecture uh, by large accumulation of uncalcified osteoid is a feature of osteomalacia uh, blood uh, will show you low serum calcium levels uh, low phosphorus levels and as i told you the moment a bone starts forming you are going to have high alkaline phosphatase levels so what is the treatment uh, basic treatment is supplementation in case of nutritional deficiency you start with 400 international units of vitamin d uh, per day uh, you, uh, the doses are to be increased in case of uh, malabsorption syndromes or chronic renal failures uh, like symptoms uh, along with vitamin d you have to start the patient with calcium supplementation that is a minimum of 500 milligram per day the treatment duration is going to be long it's going to be for two to three months minimum and finally what you do is you uh, splint and immobilize the patient in case you uh, expect impending fractures so this is basically osteomalacia in brief uh, what is osteoporosis osteoporosis uh, is a commonest metabolic disorder which is seen in commonly seen in females than males and uh, is associated with age the uh, higher the age there is higher in incidence of osteoporosis there uh, it sees it is seen as diffuse reduction in the bone density due to decrease in the bone mass this occurs why as age increases the rate of bone formation gradually decreases more than the rate of bone absorption uh, resorption thus the relate the um, relative rate of resorption is more than that more than that of bone formation thus there is decrease in the bone density so what are the causes senility as, is, as, as as i already mentioned age is an important factor in osteoporosis and most of the patients or uh, most of the higher aged population are going to have uh, decreased bone mass uh, post immobilization this is known also known as disuse disuse atrophy or uh, as you know when a patient is immobilized there is going to be loss in the muscle uh, mass this also occurs in the bone bone uh, stimulus of weight bearing is important for maintenance of bone homeostasis when a po when immobilization is given to a patient either due to fracture or due to other causes there is going to be calcium loss from the uh, respective bones post menopausal due to uh, hormonal changes 
there is occurs there uh, the estrogen which helps in uh, maintaining the bone is now decreased and hence there is a decrease in the bone density protein deficiency which occurs due to, in, at old age due to inadequate food intake or the, due to malnutrition or malabsorption or excess uh, protein loss in case of chronic renal failures or third degree burns is going to again lead to a pro, uh, lead to proper uh, mineralization of the bone uh, endocrine disorders such as cushing syndrome uh, cushing's disease and a hyperthyroid state and drug induced long term steroid therapy and phenobarbitone therapy affect the calcification of the bone and can lead to osteoporosis. So, what are the clinical features? As we saw in osteomalacia, the osteoporosis and osteomalacia clinical features are going to be quite similar. Uh, most of the patients are asymptomatic. Uh, patients will commonly present with vague bone pain. They will uh, say uh, they will have a chronic history of uh, low back pain, uh, which is mostly localized to the dorsal lumbar region. Uh, it is common because um, this region has uh, higher weight bearing and higher forces acting on it and there is higher chance of uh, fractures in the dorsal lumbar region which is commonly seen as osteoporosis. Pain again is going to be vague and uh, differentiation should be made between osteoporosis and osteomalacia because the treatment is going to vary. Uh, radiological features that we see in osteoporosis is that there is going to be decreased bone mass. Uh, there is going to be, uh, as there is a uh, decreased bone mass, uh, there is uh, the vertebra which are prone uh, in the dorsal lumbar junction are prone to vertebral compression. So there is going to be loss of vertebral height. Uh, codfish appearance is seen in this, uh, the bone, the vertebra due to the loss of calcium becomes soft. So the intervening intervertebral discs are going to uh, impinge on the above and lower vertebra, thus causing a bulging of the, bulging of the vertebra. This is known as a codfish spine. Uh, there is a diffuse loss of the calcium uh, producing a ground glass appearance. Uh, Singh's index is used to measure osteoporosis. It is divided into six grades and uh, these six grades are based on the uh, five trabecular patterns that are seen in the femoral head and neck. Uh, this, uh, you just need to know the uh, name of Singh's index, metacarpal index and vertebral index. Uh, details are not very important. Investigations of in osteoporosis will commonly reveal that the serum calcium phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase are normal. Uh, here there is no excess bone formation, rather the rate of bone resorption is more than the rate of bone formation. So therefore there is going to be a net loss of bone. As bone formation is not increased, so serum alkaline phosphatase is bound to be normal. Uh, problem what you will notice here is total, uh, total plasma proteins are going to be decreased and plasma albumin is going to be decreased. Now the most important investigation known for uh, diagnosis of osteoporosis is the DEXA scan. DEXA scan is the dual energy x-ray absorption metric scan where two x-ray beams are uh, subject, a patient is subjected to two x-ray beams and um, the computer calculates the bone dense, bone mineral density of that person. This is compared to uh, the standard, uh, the standard uh, charts for that age and sex and uh, helps uh, if the patient lies below uh, 2.5 uh, standard deviations then we say that the patient is having osteoporosis. This is the gold standard test for diagnosis of osteoporosis. Uh, so what is the treatment? As I told you that osteoporosis is commonly seen in old age where there is a deficiency of protein in the diet. So you are going to start the patient with a high protein diet, calcium supplementation, androgens, uh, vitamin D and fluoride. Uh, bis, uh, the uh, most important medical line of management which is currently developing is the use of bisphosphonates, calcitonins, parathyroid hormones and anti absorptive agents. The bisphosphonates being alindronate and pamidronate. Uh, bisphosphonates basically uh, inhibit the osteoclasts which are going to resorb bone, thus decreasing the rate of bone resorption, help, thus maintaining the bone mass. Uh, calcitonin as we had seen uh, previously, calcitonin is the hormone which uh, helps in the deposition of calcium onto the bone thus uh, nowadays the newly developed nasal calcitonin sprays have come uh, which help in the uh, help in uh, increasing the bone mass or uh, teriparatide which is a pro uh, parathyroid hormone analog helps in the uh, again helps in uh, increasing the bone mass and anti resorptive agents such as denosubab and strontium this is going to decrease the osteoclastic activity thus, main, uh, thus helping in maintaining the uh, function uh, decreasing the class uh, osteoclast activity so uh, now we come to the uh, orthopedic management in case of osteoporosis 
as I told you, immobilization is going to cause net bone loss. So, uh, exercise is a major stimulus for bone growth and remodeling. So, uh, encouraging the patient to take a walk, encouraging the patient to move around uh, is uh, in old age, uh, walking around, uh, having a, a good 20 to 30 minutes walk per day is going to help the uh, bone uh, get enough stimulus for remodeling. Finally, uh, in cases of spinal fractures, uh, bracing with ash brace or tailor brace is necessary to help in preventing uh, fractures of the uh, spine and in case of osteoporotic fractures usually the patient is not going to present with any neurological deficit and the treatment is going to be conservative management. Conservative management is done with ash brace or tailor brace and the patient is started on vitamin D and calcium supplementation to increase the bone mass and prevent further collapse of the vertebrae. Finally, the last uh, topic is uh, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, hyperparathyroidism is uh, a disease which uh, presents in less than half the patients uh, as bone, uh, bony involvement. Presentation either involves the bone or the uh, kidney but never both. So it is uh, in patients with renal stones, uh, increased renal stones or in patients with bony disease. Uh, especially when there is uh, lytic diseases of the bone or there is bone loss, it is important to rule out hyperparathyroidism as a cause. Uh, the clinical features that uh, are with hyperparathyroidism is common in women. Uh, there is bone pains uh, which is commonly uh, again a vague symptom but a classic feature of hyperparathyroidism. Hyperparathyroidism is usually diagnosed late. Uh, the uh, child the uh, patient does not uh, usually uh, come with uh, classic features and may present to you with a pathological fracture which needs to be diagnosed and treated properly otherwise may go uh, otherwise union may be delayed uh, brown's tumors are uh, lytic uh, are again lytic lesions in bone which are a common feature of hyperparathyroidism the constitutional symptoms uh, are anorexia nausea vomiting and abdominal cramps Rarely renal colic with uh, hematuria is a feature. This is basically due to the formation of uh, renal stone which is commonly seen in hyperparathyroidism. Uh, what are the radiological features that we see in hyperparathyroidism? Irregular diffuse rarefaction. Salt and pepper appearance of the skull is a classic feature of hyperparathyroidism due to uh, patchy, uh, loss, patchy lytic lesion which is seen in the skull. Uh, loss of lamina dura, uh, subperiosteal resorption, Brown's tumors that is an expansile lytic lesion which is seen and finally renal calculi. So what do you do uh, in how do you diagnose hyperparathyroidism? You go for serum calcium levels which are going to be raised. As uh, you know the parathyroid function is basically that it uh, increases calcium reabsorption from the kidney with respect to phosphorus. So it is going to uh, increase in hyperparath increase in parathyroid hormone is going to increase serum calcium levels. It is going to decrease the uh, serum phosphorus levels, and as there is lytic lesions in the bone and increased bone formation, there is going to be increased uh, alkaline phosphatase serum alkaline phosphatase. As uh, parathyroid hormone increases calcium in the body, it's going to decrease excretion. So there is low urine calcium and high urine phosphorus ions. Uh, what is the treatment of hyperparathyroidism? The basic treatment is removal of the basic cause that is the excision of the hormone secreting tumor. If the tumor is present in uh, the hyper in the parathyroid gland, uh, parathyroid adenoma is a common cause then there is going to, then uh, treatment is going to involve surgical excision of the gland thus decreasing the parathyroid levels in the body. Uh, orthopedic uh, treatment is basically the protection of the softened bones and deforming stress and strain until recalcification can occur and the bone strength can be regained. Finally, surgical correction of the deformities is uh, important once the treatment of hyperparathyroidism is complete and the bone has regained its strength. The urologic treatment is uh, calculi uh, removal and uh, maintenance of the uh, urine output and uh, maintenance of the parathyroid level such that re recurrent formation of calculi does not occur. So uh, that's it for today, uh, we'll just take a brief overview of uh, the diseases that we have covered and rickets in general. So we, uh, uh, today we ha ha so the brief of today is that we went through uh, all the metabolic bone diseases 
uh, we went through what bone, what are the constituents of bone, uh, calcium, uh, what is, how, why is calcium important, uh, how much calcium is there, what is the rule of three in bone and calcium uh, metabolism, those are the three tissues, the three hormones and the three cells. We went to the function of calcium, the sources of calcium, uh, required daily allowance, uh, what is metabolism of calcium, how calcium is excreted, from where it is reabsorbed and what is its relationship to bone. Uh, what are the three hormones, what are the function of three hormones on three distinct sites that is the intestine, the kidney and the bone. Finally, rickets in osteomalacia. Uh, we, uh, said, uh, we, 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 we saw that the uh, basic is a failure in the calcification of osteoid matrices. Uh, rickets, the causes of rickets, what are type 1 rickets, type 2 rickets. What, uh, what is the basic pathology behind the uh, rickets. What are the uh, symptoms you see in a child of rickets. What are the signs. Uh, we saw uh, we saw the classic Harrison sulcus, the pigeon chest appearance, the bow leg, knock knee, windswept deformities, the radiological features uh, classically seen in rickets, the other investigations such as serum, uh, calcium, phosphorus levels and finally we went to the treatment. Uh, similar was the case with osteomalacia. osteomalacia uh, we saw how to differentiate between osteomalacia and osteoporosis. Osteoporosis being uh, a net loss of bone or uh, osteomalacia being due to deficiency of calcium. Uh, which is unrelated to age and can occur in any age group whereas osteoporosis is commonly seen with higher age group uh, people and uh, the treatment uh, conservative line of management and the uh, correct, uh, correction of the deformities once the uh, metabolic uh, disorder has been controlled and finally hyperparathyroidism uh, which is an important uh, cause in women of uh, pathological fractures and Brown's tumors and uh, how to differentiate uh, between the tumors and how to uh, ident uh, diagnose based on laboratory investigations for hyperparathyroidism and what is the treatment of hyperparathyroidism. Thank you.